Thank I'll, you I'll, so I'll much. stand here and wave. No, it's fine. It's really okay. But I'll just begin by making uh, two comments. Uh, you know, the discussion is about African hidden water, and I look at this room, and I'm asking myself where the African leaders that make decisions, the smallholder farmers that are using this water might be in this room, or how many of us are actually involved in agriculture production. Uh, that's one. The second one is to ODI and my colleagues is whether there is an opportunity to take this discussion to where those people are so that they can resonate with it but then also look at the practicalities of using this useful knowledge. Uh, looking at that slide, I just wanted to echo, to look more at the smallholder farmers. In the background is that lady. She's Sophia Cheng a smallholder farmer coming from the northern part of the country. Uh, Taylor has just talked about the north. They have bimodal rain. Those are the challenges she's faced with. I'll not go through them. Karen earlier on talked about them. But when we talk about groundwater in a country, in an area where land is owned under customary tenure, we increase her vulnerability. In the way that it's likely she does not have control, she does not own land, but she can only access it and use it. Therefore, she cannot even take investment decisions to put such infrastructure in place, even if she wanted to. If you do provide that water or successfully, despite the hurdles, it's also likely that she will lose her land to people who have resources. So what does that mean? I'll proceed. Uh, then when you look at, uh, there are three issues that I raise in there. Uh, when we look at water, groundwater, the question would be, do we look at it in the context of increasing the economic potential and compromising the environmental aspects? Uh, he already says that the amounts of water and groundwater is little. What does that mean, uh, realistically? Uh, but then also, can we ensure more productive efficiency of this water on farm in terms of irrigation? Can we reuse the urban water waste into the productive systems? And maybe applying the principles of demand management to improve efficiency. In terms of allocation, the return on investment in water, and then also looking at the intersectoral allocation and international allocation of these waters. Because also, there are those produces that are coming in as a result of people who produce big. And then we have that coming back into the development countries. What, what are the implications? Um, lastly, what are the issues? For me, again, like he's rightly put it, it's about how much water there is, how does it change over the period of time in terms of the cropping season, in terms of within the year. Uh, but then also, again, it's about the regulation. I've already talked about the dilemma Sophie Acheng is in, this molder farmer, in terms of are we able to have sufficient licensing for the people who are using pumps, uh, the other question is the monitoring, the change in terms of the water, uh, and then also looking at the capacity, the technologies, the skills that would be needed to use this kind of technologies in the context of the developing country. But then also it's also about the conjunctive use of the green water, rain-fed systems, increasing moisture content, and things like that. Uh, now, lastly, uh, when you look at that pictorial, uh, it's basically up, it's an irrigation system on a river. On this end, it's, uh, it's a soil cover, it's mulching, basically enhancing the green water. And this is rainwater harvesting. On my extreme left, right, it's really um, r rooftop rainwater harvesting. On the other end, it's runoff management. These are some of the practical, appropriate things which are cost effective that people can use. And then uh, lastly, what do we need to consider? For me, I think the question of public ownership of groundwater needs to be legis legislated, as the, where you have the state kind of providing the use rights. But then also, you also want to look at the issue of uh, uh, allocating or the licensing, be trying to look at the costs, the pricing for this water. Because at the end of the earlier on, I asked who is paying the cost, who is paying for it? Because, you know, at the end of it all, when we have this water being used, we tend to look at how much it's bringing out. But how much do we invest back 
into the resource. I'm coming from a natural resource background. How much are we putting back into that resource? And then maybe also we need to recognize and protect the environmental services provided by this resource. Now, from the two presentations, I picked some three issues. And for me, they present both opportunities and risks. One of them was uh, the feasibility of the solar irrigation. It's an opportunity in that it can enhance access to water. But it's a risk in that it's a risk in that it can actually dry up the aquifers. Uh, the other thing that I picked on was the tenure security, which I've already raised, uh, which I think is something that we need to reflect on. Uh, and the other thing is about access to technologies. Uh, he talked about the supply chain. And indeed, it's true that you can actually know who is supplying the pipes and everything and drilling in Uganda. So to the smallholder farmers, where are the private sector players in this equation? And how do you get them to meaningfully contribute to the farmers without exploiting them? But then also provide those appropriate technologies that, uh, that can enhance the agricultural product productivity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Violet. Uh, you, you've anticipated my question in an uncanny, uncanny way, uh, because what I was going to ask is my initial question to the panel was having heard a series of presentations over the course of the day which have problematized these issues and made them extremely interesting and rich. If I was a policymaker in Africa, what would be your top recommendations to me that I should take away from this in terms of what I can advise other members of my government and what I should do. So you've already begun to draw out some of these, these conclusions and these lessons, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'd like to give the opportunity to the other members of the panel to respond to the same point, and then uh, perhaps ask you to respond once more, Violet. So Steve, can I start with you? I'm going to give you two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Hi. There you go. I'm a policymaker. I have limited attention. <laughs> Okay, uh, the two-minute version of this says, uh, fascinating day, lots of problematizing, but for those of us of a certain age, these are old stories. Um, and you say, oh my goodness, all very difficult. For 10 years now, we've seen a resurgence of interest in agriculture in, in Africa from the part of governments, from NGOs, and of course, big, big capital, some of it foreign capital. Um, and irrigation is the dog that hasn't barked. People rabbit on about, let's get this seed and the other seed. Huge debates over, sorry, over, too far, too close? Yeah, over, over GM and all of that. Almost nothing said about irrigation. Almost nothing. Um, and that's a real surprise. So you say old stories, old problems, you know, and we've got to, uh, I, I won't go through the list of, list of problems, but something has changed. And what's changed is the market opportunities, yeah? Uh, the markets inside of Africa are growing, middle classes are demanding higher value produce, and farmers who can grow this, who've got the decent market access, they're in the game. And every time I see these farmers, they've got some form of irrigation. And when I do the gross margins on it, when somebody gives me the numbers to do the gross margins, they're spectacular. Bruce over there has said $10,000 per hectare, you've got to be joking. Well, if you saw my gross margin, the things I've got on spreadsheets, you'd say, we can pay $10,000 a hectare if we, could, if we can go to work on irrigated tomatoes and things like that. So a lot of this is going to happen whether you like it or not. And a lot of the debate here has been from optimal use of resources and the rest. And the reality is, from a policy point of view, stuff is going to happen. So you then say, is there a minimum policy package that makes sure we don't get the worst stuff? And Shilp has actually given us a story from India, which I thought was going to be totally dismal, and I, actually, it actually perked me up. Because he said, actually, the really big problem there is the free electricity. Take away the free electricity and the problem's gone. That's what I heard from Gujarat. That's, that's a horrible reduction of what Shilp said. But it, but it did seem to be the story from Gujarat. Take away the dirt cheap electricity 24 hours a a day, and boy, we actually get aquitas recharging. So what's in this minimum, pack minimum package? Uh, package? Violet's given at least two of them. Uh, I've got three on my list, so 
big, big thing about land rights, and land rights matters whether we're in irrigation or anything else. Protecting people's land rights from commercial instincts, yeah, big issue across the, across the continent. The second one on there, you, you, you referred to it, I have it under economist jargon, dealing with the rural market failures that, people, that mean that people can't get finance, can't get insurance, can't get inputs and so on. And that applies a fortiori if you're into irrigation. Let's give the people who've got the chance to do irrigation the inputs, the finance and so on to get on with the job. And then the third little package is something about generating a little bit more information. And we've got to look for optimal information here. A few, a few I I indicators and some forms of very simple and transparent regulation and governance. For those places where geologically we've, we, we've got a problem of scarcity. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, Bruce. I thought you might Sooner. go to Eva next. Um, <laughs> okay, as briefly as I can, we were asked to come up with some policy ideas, one of which I think is uh, research. Of course, I'd say that. But, I, but I'm particularly interested in research of groundwater projects that might have been started by donors sort of 20 years ago, and just to sort of return to them and figure out where they've got to. And I know that HR Wallingford, there are representatives in the ground, or the Wallingford group, looked at lateral wells in Zimbabwe, uh, which is a sort of fracking approach to uh, uh, water release in basement complex, as far as I could see, if I remember the, the project. And yeah. John, so, you know, those were village level, small irrigated gardens produced in basement complex where the normal water yield was very low. What's the, did they survive? You know, that's a very interesting story. Um, okay, so I'll finish. So that's one thing. The second one is, what's the entry point? You know, there's a grave risk here that we're looking at supply of water, su supply management, but in a supply side way of thinking. In other words, let's go down the donor route, let's produce uh, the 5,000 pounds, let's get in the truck that delivers the uh, drill, let's provide the center pivot. All of that is supply side thinking to a supply side problem, and I think that's a grave risk. So we've got to turn it around into, you know, what, is the, what, what are the demands for this? Mm -hmm. And how do we foster that, and how do we understand a demand approach to, s to, to supplies of water? Uh, and I think that's absolutely critical, you know, and I suspect that the problem here is its uh, capability for planning, <laughs> capability for local districts and irrigation systems and catchments to frame the right kind of question and then to pay for the right kinds of uh, little surveys that can answer their questions so they can zone work out where the constraints are, where the water right problems are, where the land right problems are. In some cases it might be a borehole, in some cases it might be closing down a borehole. And I think that ability to map, uh, survey, frame, organize at a sort of district level is, is not something we've heard much about today and I think that's where the weakness is. And I think working with the relationship between district planning officers and their client, their, villi their village level clients, their farmers, that's key to this. Because the resources that are at the district level and at the village, ward, and farm level are, are, are going to be critical to this. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. That certainly resonates with my experience in North Africa. Ava. Um, you get the last word from the panel. Yeah, exactly. I've got now the most difficult bit because a lot has been said and um, I can basically repeat, um, which is always a bit of a boring part in panels, but hey-ho. Um, I think what I... It, it has been mentioned a lot is, is that the link between the land and the, and the water. And it's also, it goes up to the whole regulation question, who has a say on land and who has a say on, on water. And I think separating the two things out, um, as is being done in a lot of cases where one bit is dealt with the Ministry of, of Water and another bit is dealt with the Ministry of Agriculture, where it's irrigated agriculture is very sort of contentious. And I think we need to, to try and, and bring those two things together because otherwise the, the big problems will, will emerge, as we have seen in other countries, where where this kind of atomized 
uh, use of groundwater has, has spiraled out of control. And I, I do see a lot of, of actions happening in Africa, as Bruce said. It is happening anyway. Um, when people can get access to relatively cheap diesel pumps, which are now becoming more and more available, even in remote parts, and people buy them and access shallow groundwater wherever they can. Um, and, and without kind of regulating that across the different ministries, we will certainly have a big issue. Um, and the other bit, I think, is, is the whole question of, of environmental management um, as a, a form, because a lot of, of that groundwater irrigation will be shallow groundwater, will be recharged on an interannual, annual basis. How do we secure the, the natural resource management as part of a sustainability question, enhancing the resilience of water supplies and also then of, of agricultural production? So the, the link of, of the, the whole recharge natural resource management back to irrigation, I think, is crucially important. Thank you. Now, I'd like to open it up. So this is everybody's chance to ask questions. But I'd encourage you not just to ask questions of the panel um, or of the speakers of the day, but of each other. Ask general questions to the floor, um, wherever they may fall. So. Thank you. Yeah, I'm John Garing. <coughs> I'm John Gang from Newcastle University. Um, it's been an interesting day, in part because I'm used to coming to meetings and, and interfacing with irrigation people and agriculture and socio-economists, but rarely with hydrogeologists. So, uh, it, and, and today has been different from that perspective. And one interesting thing that, that strikes me of possibly where we have different points of view uh, vis -a my background obviously is more from agriculture and irrigation and my view of the, the answer to the question about the, the role for the hidden water is the focus should be on the accessibility of the resource to the target group of small scale irrigators. Uh, and for me the analysis of the, the resource problem is from that dimension, from that direction Whereas I suspect that the hydrogeologists are coming at it from a rather different perspective and looking at where is the potential for the resource. And, and they're therefore targeting different resources, I think, from those um, th that uh, would be th the, the focus for me. So, so that's really what one, one point. The, the second, I'd just like to pick up on this um, anarchy issue that uh, I think came from the interesting talk on the situation in India, and to an extent, Bruce picked it up in, in his uh, short summary just now. I, I'd be interested to know uh, from the experience in India if there are examples where local <laughs> governance arrangements have been able to overcome this issue of anarchy, because uh, we're working on a <coughs> some a pilot study in Ethiopia where we're looking at that issue directly uh, and our premise is that the management of the shallow accessible groundwater resource must be at the community level through participatory mechanisms mm -hmm. and that is the only reasonable way we think that you can overcome this anarchic development because higher level authorities as we've heard earlier don't even know where the wells are and therefore can't possibly manage them. Thank you. Does anybody want to respond to that? Shilpa? Um, okay. Well, anybody else have any other comments, questions? Back up. Thank you. It sort of follows on from, from John's comment, really. And, and, uh, um, and it's, a, it's about the institutional capacity. I think that Steve's point about this is going to ha is happening is going to happen and there's going to be a lot of opportunity opportunistic quite rapid development um what's the minimum package that we need to identify well within that minimum package institutionally in terms of capacity building in terms of the organizations who are going to have some role in this where where can you best add value where are the where are the current problems and how can you add value to that so sort of a, an institutional capacity 
question and then a more specific technical one, which is really for Richard or maybe for Alan McDonald. Um, this self-regulation -reg in, in the low transmissivity aquifers, um, I'm just curious as to what happens if you're pumping uh, in a situation like that and you're not getting the, the amount of water that you want, what do you do? Do you, do you turn the pump up or do you dig deeper and what are the energy consequences of that? And also just for the sort of the lifespan of the pumping technology, does it cause problems? Thank you. Do you have a, an answer to that one? Uh, uh, a quick answer um, is that yeah, if you if you over pump those systems um, uh, uh, locally, and you and, and actually this uh, this occurs in uh, low transmissive systems for let's say domestic or public water supplies. If you over pump those systems uh, and they uh, the water level goes below the level of the pump, yeah, your your other options do you go uh, do you go deeper? One of the one of the issues here is in these uh, overburden aquifers that the that. Uh, you know, there is a there is a finite limit to uh, to the depth of these. You move into the fractures, you may be drawing from uh, a greater distance. But I, I guess the the point I was uh, I was trying to make is that it's uh, recognize that in some environments that are more transmissive, you can essentially be stealing a neighbor's uh, if you want to think of it water by through well capture. But this becomes more problematic in in lower transmissivity systems. I don't have an answer to your question about what does a farmer do beyond go, uh, uh, a deeper well uh, under those conditions, uh, diverting, taking, importing water from further, uh, further distance. I don't know. I was just trying to, uh, in, in, in a gay, give, a w give an indication. If people did own their land, and, and Violet's raised an incredibly important point, building infrastructure on a land you don't own is, uh, has its, obviously, uh, has its issues. But that was my main point, is, is that if you own, the, if you're talking about the land that you own, uh, it would be very difficult to to uh, draw water over or substantial differences in low transmissivity systems. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Shell. Did you have a question? Sorry, did I go well, over? You, you could comment. Uh, yeah. Quite mature, this. Quite sure. Would you like to come in on that before I? I'm not sure if you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you, but uh, I thought we were still getting more questions. <laughs> well, it's more of a sort of free-flowing conversation at this point. Um, we've got some people yeah, who okay, are eager to talk on the hydrogeology aspects, um, okay. I can tell. But if you've if you got something that you would like to come in on. Yeah, okay. Actually, there are, <clears throat> there are three or four interesting points. Um, and let me start backward by answering the point which was just being discussed. What do farmers do other than just keep going deeper? And when... To go deeper is even more difficult in hard rock aquifers because it's also very costly. Um, farmers in Saurashtra basically do horizontal boring. Uh, so they they drill vertically and then they also drill uh, horizontally and and they they do that not not using expensive drills. They do that with dynamite. Yes. And there is there is there is a particular community which which comes from Rajasthan. Uh, they are migrant laborers, and over the years they have built uh, expertise in doing that. It's it's very risky, uh, but it's 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 now being taught, uh, passed on from generation to generation. So a particular community is now expert in doing uh, horizontal boring and in doing low cost wells using uh, cheap dynamite. Um, We've also heard stories of a, a large number of drillers from Andhra Pradesh, which is again another high groundwater use area, um, also hard rock aquifer, from one particular district who are just migrating to several countries in sub-Saharan Africa, basically to start getting into the drilling business. Uh, and and I, we have not done studies on this, but it would probably be very interesting to study what their business model is because from what I have heard, they're basically offering to drill at one fifth the price, which is currently in the market. And I don't know how they're doing it. They are carrying some some of their own equipment from here, which is expensive. But if they if they work there for a couple of years, they can recover uh, almost the entire cost of the drill, and then they don't have to bring it back. They can just sell it off as scrap. 
so there is there is a lot of the things happening and i i like the the approach which some of the speakers are saying look yes there might be over exploitation and there might be physical uh, limitations to how much groundwater can be exploited without worrying about sustainability but the fact is whether you like it or not it's not it's going to happen and if we don't do something about it it's going to happen in a way which is much worse than the, you know the fears that we have at this moment so we have to understand that once the farmers realize the value of this groundwater and they don't need they don't need very high uh, they don't need very high uh, i don't know liters per second uh, it's it's the pr protective irrigation which is the most valuable the first irrigation that any crops crop gets is the most valuable right so even if even if they are not able to do summer paddy or boro rice even if they are just able to uh, prevent their crop from dying you know that's the, the the biggest disadvantage of rain fed cropping is that you don't have any control over it and if you can give it protective irrigation using groundwater that itself will be a great value uh so there are there are large number of things happening in india and it's not it's not just that you stop free electricity and everything will be solved uh although that's that's a fair summary of what i said uh <laughs> but there are there are also there are also newer challenges uh in in terms of solar irrigation because solar irrigation is exactly that it's a high capital cost but there is zero marginal cost and the way state governments in india are subsidizing solar irrigation pumps to 85 to 90% it's going to create another problem mm -hmm. but the kind of intelligent rationing that gujarat has done i think that offers some interesting lessons also for sub saharan africa thank you very much indeed shop shop um so okay i uh, alan mcdonald again for pgs i just wanted to come in again on the if what do you do the farmer do if the borehole doesn't yield enough. I think drilling deeper in a lot of these aquifers doesn't work. If they've already drilled a borehole about 50 meters or so, actually drilling deeper probably won't work at all. And what happens is that excessive strain and stress is put on the pumps and you get much more frequent breakdowns. And if you're trying to take too much out, then you have a lot of costs and, and, uh, and problems with that borehole. I also wanted to highlight uh, a difference between the hard rocks in India and the hard rocks in Africa, a lot of them, the, the basement rocks of peninsular uh, India tend to be slightly more transmissive than, than a lot of those across Africa. They tend to be more highly weathered, so you can pull out a lot more water. So if you, you are more likely to get a successful borehole if you drill it than across large parts of the basement aquifer in, in Africa. We have to look harder to find good sites for boreholes and where you're unlikely to get higher yields and maybe a uh, half a litre to one litre a second. So that's an important difference when we're, when we're, we're looking at lessons uh, to be learned from India. Thank you very much. Uh, more points. I'll come over here and then I'll come back to you. Sir. One thing that we haven't really touched, uh, I'm Edward Mallory, I'm an independent consultant. Um, and one th question I have is, what should we do about it in terms of governments, donors, wanting to enhance, you know, get groundwater irrigation growing in Africa? What, what do we do? And maybe there's some lessons again from, from India, Bangladesh, where India has gone down a route of some pretty heavy subsidies on irrigation equipment, on boring costs and so on. Uh, Bangladesh liberalized in a very open free market with no got rid of its subsidies, got rid of any uh, import restrictions, got rid of any well zoning restrictions, permits, etc. Result is much cheaper to put in wells in Bangladesh than it is in India, uh, or to buy equipment. Um, there's there's a, a more competition in the supply chain. I think that's a, a lesson. People are talking about the impact of roads on groundwater. And I think if we can let markets function as freely as possibly uh, uh, and um, without trying to say, well, look, we'll give this, we'll give that, we'll give the other. It, it, it doesn't create a free market. Thank you. I'll come back to you, and I just want to come over here first. <coughs> Rod, Rod, Roger Jewell, consultant. A quick question, particularly sparked off by something that um, 
Pilot uh, mentioned earlier. Um, one is the political and one is the economic, I suppose. Um, firstly, can anyone enlighten me a little bit on the influence of the Chinese in the African water systems? And secondly, the question of relying on governments to grant licenses to extract water, why is me slightly given the susceptibility to of governments to corruption? Thank you. Now I'm going to take one more question from over here, and then I'm going to ask the panel to reflect on some of the things that they've heard. Hi, uh, Brenda Bromwich. Um, uh, picking up on something Bruce uh, mentioned, which I very much agreed with, which is um, making the link between what donors are saying and the problems of being supply orientated, because I think it got a great deal worse in the last few years um, uh, with the focus, the whole results agenda. Um, if you look at um, DFID's new huge um, East Sudan uh, investment, um, it started off with a pledge made at a donor conference in Kuwait for Eastern Sudan where they would provide water for um, half a million people. Now, if you're in a dry land, you've got to work out, well, what actually does that mean? Because if you lead on a supply-based uh, uh, approach, then you put in a permanent borehole, then you can have too much cattle kind of come around that area and you end up destroying the grassland around it as well. So. Uh, this is a, a, a problem which happens quite regularly in dry land water programming. Now, given the huge amount of spend of donor money on humanitarian responses as opposed to development responses, and if you look at how many massive um, uh, conflicts there are in dry lands, I'm not making any connection there, but it's just you've got Syria, Somalia, you've got northern Kenya, uh, Sudan, um, areas in the Sahel, then it's very, very important that we take this dialogue to the big spend in the humanitarian area and drawing on your comment earlier about, well, what is your actual chance of regulating this? It's got to be around local management because, but this is a little bit flying in the face of the emergency rights-based mantra where everyone has a right to 15 litres of water per person per day, which doesn't sound much, but is a lot if you're on a dry land. So I, I think that um, whilst the, the focus of, of this discussion is very rightly on policy options in Africa, that when uh, you've got a crisis a la Darfur with over a billion dollars a year being spent in the humanitarian sector, well, actually, you set up a whole load of entitlements that people will carry on for the post-recovery area and what we find in Darfur is it's more difficult to, to move to that transition to, to recovery and uh, self-sufficiency because people have been given entitlements to something over and above what the resource can provide during the emergency period. So it's not particularly attractive to leave your IDP camp, even if your IDP camp is grossly um, overexploited. So I think there's a, there's a need to broaden that debate, but just to flag that up rather than over here. Thank you. Um, our distinguished panel, I was tempted to run through in reverse order, but uh, I think it's probably fairer to ask if anybody has something they'd like to respond to. <coughs> Violet. Yes, I just wanted to make a comment on uh, the regulation, why government ought to do that amidst the growing tendencies of corruption. Uh, whether, well, I just, my personal opinion is that uh, uh, whether we like it or not, we need institutions. And institutions must be given an opportunity to function. And I also believe that the corruption and the many governance issues we see in some of the, can some of the countries we are coming from have a, have a lifetime and they'll come to an end. And uh, therefore, uh, I think and I strongly believe that we should have government put in place the appropriate legislation, put in place the um, kind of the monitoring mechanisms, whether they implement them or not, when they are done, when, they are, when their time of, of management gets, it ends, 
another government that believes in systems, that believes in structures, that believes in the rule of law, will operationalize them. But also to say that we need to bring in the voices of the people so that the rules and the regulations that are being in put in place reflect the aspirations of the people that they are meant to serve. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ava, Bruce, Steve. Well, maybe just a, a, a quick one, I think, on, on, on the governance and, and sort of the subsidiarity in a way of where decisions are taken. And I think that's probably a crucial one. Again, um, we have heard it today. There is not one technology. There is not one, uh, one approach. There is not one size to even groundwater-based irrigation. And I think there are m so many different systems that will, that will evolve or have already evolved that will need completely different governance structures. So some of, of the irrigation will definitely have to be and can also be uh, managed and regulated at district level or even lower, where, where people come together and organize themselves with the support of a district. But th there will also be those cases where large investment is coming in, where, where you need that national kind of governance. Um, and without that, I, I think you know, we, we would be running into serious issue. But I th th the point I want to make here is there will not be one kind of of way forward, there will be so many different scales and sizes of, of groundwater-based irrigation which will need different ways of regulation. Um, and also within different kind of, within a country, based on, on what kind of groundwater is accessed, different systems will, will naturally evolve. Yeah. Um, I, I thought all the comment, all, th all the questions were were mainly just comments and um, from my perspective. So I'm not sure I really add much uh, in terms of specific answers. I just, one thing which I think, I'm greatly taken by the idea that you should sort of situate problem solving at the sort of community level. But at the same time, one needs to stretch the idea of what a, a community is and the learning that, under, uh, that happens at, at that level. Because if you simply go with what a community voices as their immediate needs, you know you, that that will heavily skew the skew the situation. I think the opportunity for not necessarily corruption, but for just priority needs, rather than getting underneath and working out what particular problems exist uh, that may not be in water, they may be in the land sector, or they may be to do with livelihoods, that, you know, uh, or markets. And so I think it's that sort of how do you situate within the community a sort of learning ethic. Uh, uh, and Declan's issue about capacity building, what, what kinds of um, training needs get vocalized by a community that realizes the complexity of these, situa of these problems? Well, then it may not be, as I've pointed out, it may not be water training. It may be how to run a set of accounts um, or how to do some basic economics, um, how to do a sort of cost-benefit analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Steve, two minutes. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's a question for others in the room, and that is we've had a lot of comments about governance and, and collective governance, community-level governance, all very wise counsel. There's absolutely no point in doing that if there isn't a resource allocation problem. And so my question is to the hydrogeologists in the room, how easy is it to produce a clear, transparent map for each country that says, in this district, we've got an allocation problem. In this district, quite frankly, you'd have to do something quite remarkable to upset the natural systems. Mm. Because you've been telling us about some areas where it's very difficult. You've told us some areas the physical conditions won't even allow you to get started on it. And in other areas, the physical conditions lend themselves to problems of collective action failures. So can that be mapped in a way that's useful for policymakers? Because we don't want to start setting up district water committees uh, for allocation in a district where it's simply not an issue. So can, you know, is, there, is there an information issue there where you can produce clear maps that people can then react to? Or is it much more complicated than that? Would any hydrogeologist like to take a stab at that one? <coughs> oh. I'm sure we'd all like to take a stab at that one. Uh, yes, of course, of course it is. But you just need to look at the investment that had to go into Europe 
to get us to understand our aquifers here, to understand uh, how vulnerable our aquifers are to pollution. So yes, it can be mapped, and the, uh, but it takes a lot of investment, a lot of time, a lot of expertise mm -hmm. uh, to try and tease out what the groundwater resources are in a, in a small area. It's relatively, if you say this quietly, it's relatively easy to do it for a whole continent because you know, you're know you not getting into the detail there. Yeah. But to get yeah. into the detail and complexity yeah. of a, a district or region it takes a lot of expertise, uh, a lot of time. Uh, so yes, of course it's possible, but you need a lot of resources. Right. Yeah. It's not always a good thing to wait to, to allocate and regulate until you have a problem because in the, you, what you can have is that, uh, and we have it in the UK, where if you, if from an early age, it's the historical, the historical rights and the strongest people yeah. who uh, get the water flows uphill to, if you, you know, in the end. <laughs> we have a problem here where historical UK water, water rights for water companies predate good knowledge of water resources and they have they have they have historical rights that can't be met yeah. Yeah. thank you I'm going to take this yeah. is the last question that I'm going to take and then I have one final question for Shul I hope you're ready sir thank you it's not a question it's a reply to that uh, data one um, basically uh, if that question had been asked like 10 15 years ago is it possible to map all these things the answer would still be yes, but they expensively, with a lot of people and a lot of technology inputs. Uh, but I think an opportunity is opening up with the expanse of uh, mobile networks, with the advances in data loggers and uh, sort of smart sensors to map things at a level of detail now, that both on uh, on the hydrograph and in terms of river flows and the groundwater levels, uh, which wasn't possible 10 years ago um, and in terms of uh, imagining a community level uh, water resource management system then if you don't have the data it's very difficult to manage something so uh, but I don't think I think that opportunity is there thank you very much now Shil, we, we began this discussion uh, I, I began by asking for policy recommendations from our distinguished panel. Um, you, you were saying that with the benefit of hindsight in India, uh, things might have been done differently. And um, since we're here to learn from the experience of Asia, I was wondering if you could tell us what your, the three things you would have done differently, what would they be? Um. Unfortunately, I can't see very clearly now. Maybe it's just a glitch in the network. But anyway, I understand that you're asking for policy recommendations. Yes, briefly. Is that right? Yeah. OK. Um, well, I, I don't have a magic wand. I don't know. Uh, but there are there are indications that um, if, we, if we agree with the approach that, OK, even if we don't do anything, things are going to move on their own way anyway. Then, because even in India, we are now talking about aquifer mapping. We are talking about, can we map every sub-district? Can we see where is the resource? Can we have some regulation for areas where, where there is more resource and different regulations? But that's going to take another 20 years. And obviously, by then, the groundwater revolution would have moved on. So mapping the resource is good, and I think it should be done. Uh, not only at the continent scale, but also at the country scale. But the farmers are not going to wait, and no, nor should they be made to wait. Um, the first thing I think that would really propel groundwater irrigation is somehow uh, provide energy. If electricity, provision of electricity is going to be difficult, then simple petrol or diesel subsidies can work equally well. Um, we are obviously talking about uh, making sure that these subsidies are not uh, cornered by the commercial farmers who are probably equally likely to want such subsidies, uh, but set up some rules so that only the smallholders can access these subsidies. Uh, this, the second interesting point which was raised only in passing was, I think, 
the the fact about developing the market itself uh, making sure that input and output markets are well developed partly it's a chicken and egg it will happen as as there is more demand the market itself will develop but uh, i'm sure there are there are also steps which the governments can take to make sure that you know infrastructure wise there is improvement the petrol and diesel is easily accessible accessible even when uh, electricity is not um so these are these are the two two broad things i can i can say at this moment thank you very much indeed so uh, with that i'd like to ask you to thank our panel and our speakers from this afternoon um,